The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Now I'm beginning to wonder, did we really ever have a priest shortage when so many good holy priests were chased out into seminary? We keep telling girls, we want to liberate you, but they are simply being given a vision of womanhood that they are expected to follow. I was overseas and the professor said, well, you know, these are really difficult questions. So who's to say who's right and who's wrong? And I said, well, I'm to say. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, I am giddy happy about the topic we have today and our guests and the book we're going to discuss because it is an area of particular interest for me for many years, it's something I wrote about in my doctoral studies, and I'm going to try not to go full bore philosophy professor. Uh, our guests are the author of the book, Faith, uh, Two Wings, Integrating Faith and Reason. Our topic will be Faith and Reason. Are, there enemy, are they enemies or friends? Our guests are Dr. Brian Clayton, Professor of Philosophy at Gonzaga University, Director of the Faith and Reason Institute, and his colleague, Dr. Douglas Crees, also Professor of Philosophy at Gonzaga University. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for, for joining us here on The Catholic Current. Thank you for having us. Right. Yeah, Dr. Clayton, let's, let's start with the, the title, uh, Two Wings Integrating Faith and Reason. Why that title? Well, it's drawn from um, St. Pope uh, John Paul II's encyclical Fides et Ratio, where he speaks of the two, re- two wings, faith and reason, um, uh, for the soul moving towards God. And uh, it seemed an appropriate uh, image to repeat uh, as we talked about faith and reason in the text. Uh, Dr. Kreis, isn't it the common understanding, it's something that just everybody knows, that that faith and reason are are really opposed to each other, and if you're smart, reason always wins? Well, there are many people who think that that's the case, uh, to be sure. Um, And I would say that is the dominant culture mentality. Um, I think our experience is that a surprising number of people don't really think that, but um, that's certainly the the headline that they would have us believe. Right. His, the, the common understanding is that faith is is only for people who, who can't cope with, with reality. That if you need to have your your uh, your childhood hugging blanket and you need to have that that man with the white beard sitting in the sky directing you, uh, as Freud would suggest, then then okay, muzzle tough, good for you. But if you're going to take your reality straight up, if you're going to take it neat, then there it, there's there's nothing to do but to turn to to reason. Uh, Dr. Clayton, how do you begin to formulate an answer to that? Um, well, I guess in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first way is to recognize sort of the source of that objection uh, has its roots uh, going back uh, to, to at least Feuerbach, uh, and then it's present in Freud and Marx as well. And it's actually one of the objections uh, that we take up in the in the book. Uh, this idea that it's a kind of projection, uh, God, the idea of God as a projection, a human projection onto the universe that arises from our need for security. Uh, and that, yes, as, as we grow up, we recognize we don't need the big daddy God in the sky to take care of us. And so a more adult kind of position would be to abandon that. And so it's it's a version of the crutch argument that uh, right. this is a crutch that some people have to lean on in order to get through life. Um, and, you know, if but if you're a strong and healthy, rational adult, then uh, you don't need to do that. Um, and there are different ways in which to, re- to respond to that as that argument as it comes out of Feuerbach and Freud. Um, one one of the ways 
uh, to deal with it, of course, is to point out that uh, not believing in God is subject to the same kind of argument, uh, that if you're looking at motivations for belief, uh, that's a sword that cuts in both directions. Um, there's a uh, psychologist, uh, Paul Vitz, who's written about oh, yes. the faith uh, the faith of the fatherless. And he points out um, how there's this pattern that uh, historically that set up of people who have had problematic relationships with their with their fathers, especially if the father is weak and doesn't provide um, support and protection. Uh, if that's the way the child experiences the father, then uh, many of those people turn out to be atheists. And so one can one can cut the argument in that other direction. So it's a more useful uh, uh, kind of discussion then to move away from well, what motivations might people have for believing or not believing, and just let's look at the arguments for thinking about whether God does or does not exist. So that that's one way um, to address that kind of argument. And, and you know, there's also um, a, a body of literature that suggests that one of the motivations for atheism is the dread of being held accountable for one's actions. And atheism seems to, to rescue you from that, at, at, at least at, at the human level. Um, how about well, this? Stalin, you know, uh, well, I was yes, say, Stalin. Stalin certainly, and Pol Pot certainly, you know, uh, right. they would have hoped right. that there was no right. God, that there was oh, nothing. Of course. Beyond this uh, life, yes. Uh, and and, and that, that can go all the way back to uh, the Greek atomists and Epicurus and so on. Uh, Bertrand Russell, in his book Mysticism and Logic, uh, lays out what I call kind of the Apostles' Creed of Nihilism. He doesn't call it that. That's my, my turn, my turn of it. And uh, I won't read all 10 or 12 lines, but I'll, I'll just ask for, uh, I'll just read the last sentence of it and ask for both of you to reply. Bertrand Russell writes, only within the scaffolding of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Uh, Do Dr. Kreis, your thoughts on that first, and then we'll go to you, Dr. Clayton. Yeah, well, that's uh, a pretty hard saying, isn't it? Uh, uh, we have to begin with the, uh, despair. Um, I, I don't... Uh, of course, subscribe to that, and one would wonder whether Russell really gives us any reason to uh, subscribe to uh, that uh, uh, that sort of thing. Certainly, it's the case, right, that um, that people experience uh, despair, but where that experience leads, um, many people uh, find that it leads towards God, some away from God. And I don't think there's any uh, despair doesn't necessarily lead in any particular direction. Okay, thank you. D Dr. Clayton, your thoughts on Russell's uh, statement about uh, the soul's habitation can only be in a structure of unyielding despair? Well, it's, it sounds to me as though um, it, that's a more a romantic uh, response to uh, Russell's view of the nature of reality. Uh, I mean, so it it sounds grandiose. It sounds like a grand vision, you know. That uh, yes. Well, there used to be a better class up. of atheist. I, I I've written. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I I think the key, and as a philosopher, I get, this makes sense to me that the the key is to ask, as Dr. Kreese alluded to, what are Russell's arguments for thinking that um, that the place to begin is with despair or that what we face uh, is a universe that's devoid of meaning and so forth. How do, how do you get there? What, what exactly are the arguments for that? Um, it's a and, nice And why do such sort of people sign center. contracts and plan for the future? Um, I have why no do idea. people like that have children? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it, those are good questions. I mean, it, right. I mean, so so does he really believe this? Is this really the way he winds up living his life? I don't. I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, Russell's life. Um, but uh, I mean, certainly he seemed to um, engage life, you know, sort of full throttle. Uh, right. it, it didn't seem like a very despairing kind of person. That, so it seems more of a romantic kind of statement. Um, so, so more more of a posture rather than the conclusion of an argument. Yes, that's a nice way okay. of putting it. All right. So, how, how did um, 
What does faith have to say for itself in, in the 21st century? How, how do we go beyond the claim that it's just wishful thinking? Well, uh, in our book, we uh, talk about uh, various reasons uh, to think that faith uh, might be true, i.e., the, uh, the arguments for the existence of God, consider all the so arguments against the existence of God and why they might not uh, uh, demonstrate what they uh, purport to demonstrate. Um, I think in our time, you, you have to clear away a lot of the underbrush, okay? And you uh, you can't uh, begin with where the uh, other side wants you to begin. You can't let them uh, choose the, the court that you're going to uh, play on, as it were. And so a, a lot of what we're doing in the book is to... Uh, say, uh, well, now wait a minute, let's look at these arguments. Um, in fact, they're not uh, at all um, as opposed to the whole idea of faith as some people would have us believe. Right. I, I think that we have to uh, be alert to the fact that um, we're, we're being contested for, the truth is being contested for, and by implication, our soul is being contested for. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation about faith and reason, addressing the question, are they enemies, with Dr. Brian Clayton and Dr. Douglas Crees. When, when we come back, we're going to ask the question, How does reason go wrong? We're going to look at rationalism, scientism, and naturalism. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now, 1-877-511-5483. Text us at the same number, 1-877-511-5483. After the show, go to thestationofthecross.com to download the audio as a podcast. Check out our resources list. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. If you're new to iCatholic Radio, welcome to the free mobile app of the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. It's available for download to your Android and Apple mobile devices. If you have any questions about your new app, please contact us at thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. That's thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. Through your new app, you can listen to podcasts of shows, conference talks, and prayers. View our programming grid, call us directly, and check out our mobile website. You can even learn how you can promote iCatholic Radio in your community, connect with us through social media, and financially support the programming you love. That's all available on your iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for joining our iCatholic Radio family, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Do you ever wonder where God is in your suffering or what His will is for you as you struggle in the faith? Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, a program to inspire you and offer solutions to many of life's challenges. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun whose humor and holiness, along with years of theological training, bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. That's Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is this, faith and reason, are they enemies or friends? Our guests are Dr. Brian Clayton and, Do- and Dr. Douglas Kreese of Gonzaga University, authors of the book, Two Wings, Integrating Faith and Reason. So far, we've talked about a skeptical view that reason might have of faith, and I think we've indicated that atheism takes as much blind faith as uh, as believers are often accused of by atheists. In this segment, we're going to take a look at different ways that reason can go wrong. We're going to look at rationalism, scientism, and naturalism. Uh, Dr. Clayton, we'll, we'll start with you. We got a, a note from one of our listeners, Brian in Delaware. He said, how does this way of thinking, that of, you know, the, the ascendance of, of atheism and, and rationalism, how did this way of thinking about faith and reason become so prevalent in places of higher learning? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't have a lot, a lot of insight on that. It's exactly how. I know where we are now is that there's a kind of default position culturally and especially in uh, university or academic culture that um, that atheism or unbelief or skepticism or agnosticism is kind of the default uh, position. Right. And uh, if I had to sort of on off the cuff sketch an answer, I think we'd have to look at intellectual history. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the sense that um, faith and reason began to be separated, um, and the faith being attacked um, prior to the Enlightenment, is, Enlightenment, but especially uh, during the Enlightenment, uh, and so um, as as the faith was attacked, then it, it, the dominant view at least among the educated, was that, well, we can't really prove that God exists. We can't really know that God exists. Uh, it's We may believe that God exists. It might be a good thing for people to believe that God exists. Uh, but uh, we can't really settle that question by means of reason. So therefore, where we have to start is with a position of, um, of unbelief. Uh, so either agnosticism or um, atheism. So I, I think that the cultural and intellectual roots go back several hundred years, and um, at least in this country, I think that uh, as long as uh, what I had put it, um, as long as the religious origins of the country were still sort of operative, mm-hmm. uh, that the universities managed to maintain. Um, a place for religious belief, and, and therefore uh, there wasn't sort of that presumption of atheism. But uh, as that gave way, especially in the 20th century, then sort of the floodgates were opened. Uh, and so what had happened already in Britain uh, in the 19th century, or maybe even earlier in the universities, hits this country, especially in the 20th century. Right. Well, you know, my, my mentor in philosophy, the late great Paul Weiss, who started off at City College in New York and got a, um, uh, a scholarship to Harvard University in the early 1920s, and he himself was an agnostic Jew, interested in symbolic logic, studying under Whitehead. And the way that he was taught the history of philosophy was in the beginning there was Plato and Aristotle. And then there was an era of unrelieved darkness during which absolutely nothing of intellectual significance happened, and there was no science. And then out of nowhere in the 16th century, René Descartes emerges, and the world has begun anew. And it was studying the medievals under Etienne Gilson, the great Catholic uh, thinker, scholar, who somehow ended up at Harvard for a little while, 
I said, you know, there were really important things that happened in the Middle Ages, and really smart people who believed uh, built cathedrals that didn't fall down. And he said it was reading St. Bonaventure, Paul Weiss said, that opened the transcendent to him and convinced him to give up his promising career in symbolic logic to begin a study and a career in metaphysics at a time, at least in the United States, in the 1920s, with pragmatism, and then later with the, the Vienna Circle moving to the U.S. No one was doing metaphysics except Catholic scholars in, in the Catholic ghetto. So he was a bit of a, of a lone wolf uh, that way. Uh, Dr. Kreese, what, what about the terms uh, rationalism and, and naturalism? How, uh, what's your view of them and how are they related? Well, uh, in the book, we you, you tend to uh, juxtapose rationalism with fideism. Uh, right. Rationalism being the position that the only access we have to truth is through uh, reason alone. Uh, fideism being that the uh, the only, or at least the only, truly important access that we have to truth is by uh, uh, believing or by uh, trusting. Now, naturalism is, uh, I guess, we could say one form of uh, rationalism. Uh, it seems to me to be a subset of uh, uh, rationalism. Um, but perhaps you mean something a little bit different uh, by it. But the way I would understand it is that, um, uh, you know, there is this thing, nature, according to the uh, naturalist. That's all there is, and that's, uh, there's no transcending this thing, uh, nature. And nature is, uh, can explain uh, itself. Okay, we, the, well, there's no need to uh, uh, transcend the natural uh, to get outside the nature, as it were, to try to explain nature. And so that there are, um, uh, the claim is anyway, uh, mm -hmm. natural processes can, uh, can account for absolutely all that is uh, within our experience of nature. There, there seems to be uh, the expectation, and we see this as we move into the late 19th century and then into the early 20th century, that you know, human progress, the scientific method, uh, it's, you know, the Industrial Revolution, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then later the economic science of, of Marxism, this is all, and, it, and, and then we throw in Darwin to make it extra exciting, uh, all this is leading us to, to the, again, I would call it the conviction, the posture, rather than the conclusion, I uh, mean, you know, better said, maybe the claim, that human wisdom and human goodness are sufficient for human progress. And if we all just put our heads together and be really, really, really scientific, we can only progress from glory to glory. And then World War I comes. The, the first time that we had a, a grand scale mechanized war and we saw s slaughter uh, on a scale we had never seen before, empires are in ruins, and it's this, hmm, Maybe this is where unaided reason alone, unguided reason alone, can lead us. And some people are starting to clear their throats and say, maybe it's time to give another look to, to theism and to God. But it seems that philosophy is determined, or, or better said, willing, to look at anything but God as the resource for, for the, the human uh, predicament. Uh, Dr. Clayton, do, do you see that as a reasonable account of, of relatively recent philosophical history? Um, certainly. Uh, I, I, I think that we tend to underestimate the effect of uh, the First World War on the West, um, I think that someone, an American who's, who's picked up on this uh, is actually Walker Percy, the late Walker Percy, the novelist and essayist. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he points out in numerous places what a shock to uh, the Western system uh, of thought that that First World War was. Um, and, you know, that people were killed, more people were killed in more horrible ways than ever before in human history. And the, the primary um, actors involved were the great Enlightenment nations. Uh, so you had right. Germany and France, and you had uh, Britain, especially Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. So all involved uh, in that war. And 
uh, it was uh, traumatic. And of course, it's followed then by the great social upheavals of the 1920s, the late 19-teens and then the, into the 1920s. And um, I mean, for, for some people, it does wind up sort of confirming, or, or I don't know, it, it, for some people, it does raise questions about the possibility of, is there another option here, something other than the kind of scientism um, that we've um, and, you know, look to in the in the 19th century, especially. Um, and uh, what about you know, sort of? The, so there's a kind of romantic response, um, right. but uh, there's also the possibility of a uh, religious response. And then a third possibility is just to dig in your heels, which it seems as though a lot of people. Uh, also did. I mean, the problem isn't that we had too much science, we just didn't have enough science. Uh, we didn't have enough, you know, radical, empirical sort of thinking about the nature of reality. And so we engaged in this irrational behavior, this irrational slaughter. So we just need uh, to, to, to have more science and more rational, a more rational approach to things. Right. Yeah, that would be that, Dr. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kreese, some people responded and said, well, the the problem was is that we had too blind a faith in the reliability of reason, too blind a faith in in, in the reliability of knowledge at all. And then we have uh, Heath Ledger's Joker from the Batman movies asking why so serious. How did postmodernism become a respond to the crisis of, of reason after the First World War? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> so, uh, and you've got two post-modernism, minutes. Postmodernism, yeah. <laughs> postmodernism is uh, perhaps best described by this uh, kind of uh, agnostic but ironic posture that some people have developed uh, towards um, uh, uh, reality, and um, some believers think that postmodernism. Uh, actually cuts their way more than it does uh, uh, in favor of the uh, scientists. Uh, I myself think postmodernism simply results in an abandonment of the whole quest for truth, whether from uh, from reason uh, or from faith. Right. Um, But uh, uh, how is it a response to the crisis of the 20th century? Well, I mean, if uh, science was shown to be um, wanting uh, as a result of the upheavals of the 20th century, the the caveman century, as Solzhenitsyn uh, called it, then it seems that there's reason to uh, abandon science. And, of course, these people had already abandoned faith, so there's not much left, uh, it would seem. Well, it would seem to me that postmodernism is a response to the 20th century by people who are well-fed and have reliable Internet access and, and not otherwise. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation on the relationship between faith and reason. In the next segment, we're going to talk about how is faith supposed to work and what happens if faith is not blind. And we will want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now to join us, one 511 5483 Text us to the same number, one 511 5483 After the show, download the audio's podcast at thestationofthecross.com or most major podcasting platforms. Share with your family. This is Father Robert McKaig of the Society of Jesus, host and producer of The Catholic Current. Tune into the Station of the Cross on January 17th when I join Teresa Tamio on Catholic Connection during the 9 a.m. hour Eastern Time. We will discuss the question of whether Catholic doctors are in danger of becoming safe, legal, and rare. Also, be sure to tune in each weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern for The Catholic Current. Until then, let's keep each other in prayer. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg Thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one, from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. 
from every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Podcasts of our network-produced shows are free for your listening pleasure at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Be uplifted in your faith and inspired to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on our iCatholic Radio mobile app. listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is this, faith and reason. Are they enemies or friends? Our expert guests are Dr. Brian Clayton and Dr. Douglas Kreis of Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, authors of the book Two Wings Integrating Faith and Reason. If you're just joining us, you should know that we talked about whether or not faith and reason are natural enemies. We talked about how reason can go wrong with rationalism, scientism, modernism, and even postmodernism. In this segment, we're going to look at how faith can go right and faith can go wrong. Gentlemen, let me start with two quotes from diff- very different eras, different parts of the world. And yet I think trying to make the same point. In the early part of the church's history, we have Tertullian who asks, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has the academy to do with the church? And then we have uh, from Kierkegaard, a, a, a very important thinker and passionate writer, who says, theology sits rouged at the window and courts philosophy's favor, offering to sell her charms to it. Is it a betrayal of faith to have any conversation with reason at all? Uh, Dr. C- Dr. Kreese, let's start with you. Well, um, this quotation from Tertullian uh, and the one from Kierkegaard, uh, both of these authors are uh, often viewed as being fideists or as having fideistic tendencies, at least. That is to say, they um, <clears throat> they seem to think that the only real access human beings have to truth is, is through trust in God, through belief, through faith. And uh, reason or philosophy, these are very questionable enterprises uh, because they're based on human reason, uh, is uh, the argument. Um, so neither Kierkegaard nor Tertullian seem to have much confidence in the ability of human reason to, uh, to know, to, to, to find truth. Um, through its own uh, powers. Um, I would say the attitude we take in the book is that this is, uh, uh, what, it's going too far. It's, uh, sure, there are limitations to human reason. Human beings can make mistakes. Uh, All of this is well known, as we are just talking about the 20th century. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, we, we do want to affirm the ability of human reason uh, to know truth. We're looking for an integration of faith and reason, whereas the fideist uh, seems to be satisfied with, uh, with faith alone. Uh, Dr. Clayton, how about this as uh, a, a view of the relationship between faith and reason? Let's think of it uh, as a football game. And Reason takes the ball down to the 20-yard line. The defense digs in. It's got to lateral the ball off to faith, and then faith runs in for the touchdown. Uh, what do you think of that view of the relationship between faith and reason? Um, 
I guess I need to know what the uh, analogy is supposed to represent. Uh, oh, uh, suppose, for example, you know, uh, reason indicates that we, we live in, in a rational, uh, moral universe. It seems to suggest there might be some intelligence out there. And then the defense is, say, uh, the problem of evil or quantum m- mechanics or the, the corruption of the putative corruption of the church. And then uh, for to, to really uh, achieve what human life is supposed to achieve, you need this great leap of faith into the end zone. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, I think I, I uh, think we'd want to say that faith and reason are really on the same team, advancing the ball all the way. That's, that's right, my yeah. That, was, that <laughs> right. was my problem. I was trying to figure out what how this was supposed to work. Well, well um, on, I, on this image, they are on the same team, but they have uh, very. Di- uh, in other words, one do- reason does what reason does until it can do no more, and, and then faith takes the ball in for the touchdown. Um. Well, in the sense that grace completes or perfects nature, so our natural reason can take us so far. Uh Um, It can tell us, for example, that God exists, and it can help us to understand that there are certain attributes that God has as the creator of all that exists apart from himself, etc. But it can't can't tell, and it can tell us that we're oriented towards happiness, that all of our actions are aimed at happiness. But it, what it lacks is, an, is a complete account or an, an account of the nature of that happiness. What couldn't have been guessed is what gets revealed um, to, to the church, that our, the human destiny is to be taken into the life of God, to participate in the divine life. Uh, nobody would have figured that out. You know, Aristotle right. gets so far, and then right. it really is uh, revelation. It's it's grace then that that then takes us to see uh, what he couldn't see by reason alone. But. Well, does that? I don't know how that fits with the football analogy. Uh, no, I no, I I, th- I think I think that would work. You know, when uh, when I was studying at Catholic University, and I studied with the great Monsignor Robert Sokolowski, and I was reading uh, his book, The God of Faith and Reason, in manuscript form, he said that there are truths of the faith that. Uh, can be shown to be comprehensible on their own terms, but can't possibly be demonstrated by faith. So if all the theists disappeared tomorrow, eventually religion would reemerge, but you know, no one would come up with the Trinity on their own. Gentlemen, we have a caller on the line. We have Eddie from Erie, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Catholic Current. What do you have to say to us today? Hi, uh, I'm going to cave. Uh, yeah, well, we were discussing with faith and reason, and I was going to say that... Uh, you have faith, you have reason, but a, a child, a baby child, has uh, faith in, has a belief in God and his innocence. You have reason, which uh, can define to God, okay, and you just made that example of having the reason until you get to the goal line, and then you just pure belief or in God, and that gets you into the end zone. So what? It's your intellectual thought before you reach the end zone. That's what got you to the end zone, or... <laughs> Well, as I understand, thank you for your call, Eddie. As I understand uh, the, the image, is uh, faith and reason are on the same team, and they have distinct jobs that don't overlap. But, gentlemen, I'm looking at the front cover of your book, which seems to me to be a Venn diagram to overlapping circles, and then you have, uh, you know, on your front piece inside the book, you've got you've got two overlapping circles. What do those overlapping circles uh, represent? Because I think this could help us to understand and the relationship between faith and reason? Well, one circle represents um, faith, and the other circle represents reason, and then there's an overlap between the two. Uh, And so thinking about um, both faith and reason as ways of arriving at truth, but faith operates um, through revelation, and so there we have to accept certain truths, whereas reason uh, gives us certain truths uh, that we ourselves arrive at. So we're not accepting right. it by trusting someone else. Um, but then there, so those are the two circles separate, but then there's this overlap area so that there are things that reason can tell us uh, about God, for example, that God exists, that God is uh, the creator of all that exists apart from himself, etc. And um, we can also know those things by faith, that is, we can accept them by faith. Um, so the, the, 
there's an overlap in terms of the truths that can be either accepted by faith uh, or known by reason uh, between the two. But there are things that lie outside the purview of reason, for example, that God is triune that the human destiny is to participate in the divine life. Those have to be accepted by faith. They have to be revealed um, by God to us. Uh, and then there are things that are, talk, that are discovered in, in, uh, by means of reason that aren't revealed at all, that we don't accept uh, on trust, um, things about the, the, the nature of the universe you know, the, the Pythagorean theorem or uh, the structure of the atom or whatever, those things simply aren't discussed in, in Revelation. They could have been revealed, but they didn't need to be revealed uh, for human salvation. Right. Um, and, so. and then Aquinas also says there were things that God reveals that are available to human reason, uh, you know, the immortality of the soul, the existence of God, but God right. takes the trouble to reveal them because, um, you know, some people are, are, are busy all day and don't have time to figure these things out in, in the library or, or, the, or the scriptorium. Uh, Dr. Kreese, let me ask you a question that, that I was asked every year when I was teaching philosophy. Uh, do we need God in order to be good well, I think so. Um, I, I, uh, to me, that's uh, at least I'll put it this way. Uh, obviously, we need God in order to be good in a supernatural way, in order to have mm-hmm. the uh, supreme virtues of of charity and faith and hope. Um, I, uh, for most people, uh, I think that's probably the only way to be good, uh, because mm-hmm. of what you were just saying. You know, philosophers are rare. And uh, not everybody uh, likes philosophy, and uh, not everybody can do philosophy, and not everybody has the time to sit around and think about these things the way Brian and I and and you do. Um, Mm -hmm. And so for most people, how are they going to become good? Well, I think it's through belonging to, uh, well, I think it's especially through belonging to the church. Mm-hmm. Um, through the life of the sacraments, that this is how one can be uh, become good. Is it possible, you know, this is sort of an academic question, but uh, have there been examples of uh, good people uh, who didn't have access to the sacraments, who didn't belong to the church and did? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, but I don't know if they are supremely good. But they, right. uh, obviously, they're, uh, they have some virtues they have natural right. virtues we would say right they, they, they can be just or, or they can be uh, courageous or, or generous well here's my gloss on the question to talk meaningfully about morality at all um, apart from the existence of God, I, I don't see how that works in, in the long run. Uh, I don't ha- know how you have a non-arbitrary ethics apart from some reference to, to the divine. Um, and and I, I, I so if we're going to talk about can we be good without God, we'd have to say without the existence of God, it's not clear to me how, how the question is is meaningful. Uh, do either of you gentlemen have have a take on that? Have I, have I overstated the case? Have, have I overshot the runway? Well, I, I probably think you have, uh, Father. That is to say, I, I would think that <clears throat> we, we can discern uh, natural uh, ends. Um, mm-hmm. Human nature has a, a telos and a goal. Aristotle right. was was willing and able to talk about that, right. and um, he identified that with happiness. And mm-hmm. um, and it's not simply uh, arbitrary. Uh, Aristotle mm-hmm. thought, you know, these there really are natural ends, and right. we really should want if we want to be happy, uh, assuming that mm-hmm. we want to be happy, we're going to mm-hmm. have to try to to reach them. Right. Um, so I, 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 I probably wouldn't be willing to go that far. Okay. I, 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 if we had more time, I would add about uh, you know discussions of the problem of evil, which you handle very significantly uh, in in your book uh, as well, because there are some people who think that is the absolutely unanswerable objection to the existence of God. It's traditionally well, uh, the it's the oldest uh, uh, objection to the existence of God, certainly. Right. Um, but it's not as though the theist doesn't have uh, resources uh, to respond to that. And the Christian theist in particular has other resources because it's not as though God is um, 
uh, is unresponsive to right. suffering and so forth that does exist because uh, God, uh, the incarnate God, uh, does suffer and, f- and feels the evil very directly. So. Right, because we ultimately uh, we we Christians are uh, are devotees and disciples uh, of a crucified God, uh, confounding to, to to the Greeks, but uh, but for us Christ, the glory and the wisdom and the power of God. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation about faith and reason with Dr. Clayton and Dr. Kreis, and we're going to ask about what an education that does justice to both faith and reason might look like. And we will want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now. One Eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Text us the same number one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. After the broadcast, go to the station of the cross dot com or your favorite podcast platform to download the audio, share it with family and friends, start a conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Father Yatsuk Mazer. Please join me in a prayer honoring Saint John Newman. Merciful Father, make me as selfless as St. John Newman. Throughout my life, give me the grace to direct my first thoughts to the service of you and of others. Make my prayer, your will be done, knowing that in your mercy and love, your will for me is my sanctification. I ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is Franciscan Media Saint of the Day for January 16th. Today we celebrate St. Berard and Companions. Countless holy men and women have been gifted with a missionary spirit, so strong that they leave behind their homeland and begin a new life serving people whose language and culture are unfamiliar. In the process, some of these holy men and women pay the ultimate price, martyrdom. Today we honor several such people, the first Franciscan martyrs. In 1219, with the blessing of St. Francis of Assisi, several Franciscans left Italy to preach in Morocco. Leading the group was a young follower of Francis named Berard. He and his companions tried preaching in Seville, then under Muslim control, but made no converts. They next went to Morocco, where they preached in the marketplace. The Franciscan friars were immediately apprehended and ordered to leave the country. They refused. When they began preaching again, the local leader ordered them executed. After refusing to renounce their faith, they were beheaded on January 16, 1220. Their relics were brought to Portugal, where a young man named Anthony of Padua was moved by the strength of their faith. Berard and his four companions, Peter, Ajute, Akers, and Odo, were canonized in 1481. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after the show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. You'll find a link to today's episode page where you can view Father McTague's show resources and today's podcast. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is this, faith and reason, are they enemies or friends? Our expert guests are Dr. Brian Clayton and Dr. Douglas Kreese, professors of philosophy at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, authors of the book Two Wings, Integrating Faith and Reason. If you're just joining us, you should know that we've been talking uh, for the whole hour about the relationship between faith and reason and excessive claims of reason under the umbrella of rationalism, excessive claims of faith under the umbrella of fideism. In this segment, we're going to talk about the harmony of faith and reason and what an education that does justice to both might look like. Uh, gentlemen, back in 1879, Pope Leo XIII wrote the encyclical Eterni Patris, also known as the restoration of Christian philosophy to our schools, saying that the, it was the church's mission to defend faith. In 1998, you had John Paul II writing Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, where he says it's, it's the church's job also 
to defend reason. And, and John Paul uses the image of the two wings of faith and reason to elevate the soul. And in your book, you talk about uh, a, a two-winged education. Uh, what does that look like? Dr. Clayton, let's start with you. Actually, may I defer to uh, Dr. Kreese on this? Yes. Thank well, you. Uh, uh, I, I uh, especially worked on these chapters of the book, is uh, why Dr. Clayton's saying this. What we're, we're trying to show is that uh, particularly uh, liberal arts education, that it arose in a pre-Christian world, that it um, perhaps uh, was even perfected there, um, that um, there is a kind of education, it's based especially on uh, the literary arts and the mathematical arts, and mm-hmm. we see it uh, already developed in Plato and uh, uh, thence forward. <clears throat> that kind of education seems to have a, a kind of crowning moment uh, with philosophy. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Augustine, uh, to sort of explain the story historically, Augustine, of course, studied these liberal arts that were so important to uh, Plato. Plato suggests that the, the liberal education is, you know, salvation. It's how one gets out of the cave or through these uh, liberal uh, arts. It's how one ascends to uh, the highest studies, which for Plato are philosophy. Augustine studied the liberal arts and mastered them, we might even say. He wrote books on a great many of them, um, planned to write about all of them, but then it occurred to him that in some ways the liberal arts, that kind of education wasn't really uh, helping him. He was really good at it, he remarked, mm-hmm. but uh, what's, the, what's the point of being good at something if you don't use it well? And uh, he developed, uh, um, what shall we say, uh, uh, another conclusion to this education. Um, Yes, the liberal arts were good, but beyond them one also needed theology, uh, revealed theology or scriptural theology. And uh, our suggestion in the book is that that's the classical curriculum that dominated in the Middle Ages and survived well through the Jesuits, through the Ratio Studiorum. Uh, that's the curriculum that integrates faith and reason into a singular educational uh, project. Um, now, there aren't a lot of schools around today who still understand this educational project, but it was a real curriculum. Uh, right. with a real plan, and uh, you kind of at least try to sketch it in the book. Right. And, and I, I, I find that uh, my students, when they read this chapter in the book, I save that chapter until the very end of the course, when mm-hmm. I, which I just began teaching again today. And um, my students are very excited because it makes sense out of what remains of that um, that classical Christian curriculum. Right. Um, in the university, and it, it gives there's a kind of rationale that they had not seen uh, before, and many of them wish that they had more of it, <laughs> more of the old um, curriculum. Well, you know, I, I've used uh, in my rhetoric class some of Stratford Caldecott's important work on, on the trivium, grammar, mm-hmm. logic, and rhetoric, and that is a, as a preparation for the quadrivium, which would have been a, um, a arithmetic, geometry, music, and, and astronomy. Uh, and his book on grammar, logic, and rhetoric is so beautiful, you could make a retreat. Uh, based on that. Uh, gentlemen, what do you think about this, that an extension of the classical education, which in the Catholic view would be that harmony of the two wings of faith and reason, that a, a modern attempt to get around the faith component was to say, well, we'll just have kids read the great books. You know, we'll just get the five-foot shelf uh, from Harvard, you know, the old Harvard, and, and great books will, ha- will have cultivated, rational, decent people, and, and that'll be enough. Uh, Dr. Kreese, what do you think of that? Well, in fact, that is the approach that I take today in teaching Mm -hmm. at the university. Um, I I understand uh, why that's been criticized. Uh, Father Shaw, for one, has criticized it. And um, I I, I understand the point. Um, But given where universities are today, 
Um, the one thing you can do uh, is get a list of important books and get those books before the students and then uh, and try to talk about those books with them. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's not the nicely organized curriculum mm-hmm. that, well, that one would really want to have. But we've kind of got to get get students back to a place where they could really appreciate that nicely organized curriculum. And so um, uh, I, I do myself uh, sort of as a, uh, I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but uh, I find right. it's the best way to do it in the universities I have taught at. And, and I'm sympathetic to that approach. I want to add uh, John Sr.'s criticism in his two important books, The Death of Christian Culture and The Restoration of Christian Culture, said if you present the great books to students who haven't had their moral imaginations first well cultivated by Christian culture, that the, at the end of the day you're going to have graduates from a great books program be uh, widely read skeptical dilettantes. Has that been your experience? Well, that's that's something that can happen. Uh, I, I grant that. Um, of course, I'm the one who chooses the, the list of great books, and uh, right. I make sure that there are Christian authors uh, in that list. And my students um, retain um, uh, still a certain familiarity with and interest in Christianity, even if they're not really committed to Christianity and uh, you know the Catholic novelist if he or she's really good uh, an Augustine that sort of thing I, I think really can catch their uh, imagination and so um, yeah platonic dialogues are are good um, uh-huh. they may not um, they might not be perfect uh, from the Christian point of view, but they're a, a good start for students, and then we can give them something more. Well, I'm grateful for your, your participation in this conversation today, Dr. Brian Clayton and Dr. Douglas Crees. Thank you very much for joining us today on The Catholic Current. hope we can have you back again before long. Thank you very much for having us. All right. I'm Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. Join us weekdays, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern. Join us tomorrow and welcome back independent journalist uh, Brendan Young to talk about Marian apparitions for our time. Go to alitea.org today and look for my weekly column. After the broadcast, go to thestationofthecross.com and most major platforms to download the audio as podcasts, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by The Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.